So really excited now to have our first special emphasis panel. As we thought about this forum, I must admit we had an agenda in uh, in mind, <laughs> probably pre-COVID uh, days and uh, before 2020 happened. And so uh, when we, as the meeting was getting closer and closer, though, it seemed important to think about where this meeting stood in, in the in the context of our our nation's discourse. And um, you know on. June 8th, like many other organizations in this space, Project Sleep put out a statement uh, condemning racism and making specific commitments to our community to do our part uh, to cry, try to create a better future. And one of our four commitments was to advocate for more sleep research focused on race, racism, and sleep health disparities, which was always an interesting area, but um, I'm really glad that it, you know, not that the year's events happened, but I'm glad that it's put this into focus and um, in furtherance of this commitment, we've worked with the Sleep Health Disparities Research Community to develop five specific policy recommendations, uh, which we published on September 12th. And um, we think this is important to think about uh, systemic change. And so we're really excited to have two presenters today to uh, tell you a little bit more about their work in this space and catch you up in case you're not familiar with this area of research and this body of research. Um, and so with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull up Dr. Granier's slides. Dr. Granier, are you there? Are you muted? I think I saw him here. Uh, sorry, I'm here. I was muted. Um, so I, I actually made some slide tweaks. If it's okay, I'm, I'd be happy to just share them off my screen if that works. Okay. Okay. All right, let me just pop these up. So, um, um, I was double muted. All right. Just let me know if you want me to just get started and, and talk a little bit or, or if there's anything else you wanted to say first. I was just going to introduce you, um, but you have many titles here. Oh, cool. People can see them. Um, and we're just really <laughs> grateful to Dr. Ganyer for being here. Sure, thanks. Um, so I, I'm really excited to be here and I'm really excited that this is a topic that is gaining increased focus and attention. So my task over what I'm hoping is 10 minutes or less is to sort of orient everyone to sleep and health disparities research. And uh, my goal is mostly to tell the history of, of where sleep disparities research has come um, and, and sort of where it is now and look and talking about this, this, um, these policy uh, directives. Um, I wanna start with this idea though, that especially throughout the sleep scientific community, um, sleep is often thought of as something like this, as, as a biological process or a set of biological processes that are intertwined with each other and, and have many functions and have mechanisms on health. And then there's a whole breadth and depth to this. But something that I, I continuously try to remind myself as, as a sleep and circadian researcher and, and the sleep and circadian research community um, is, is encapsulated perfectly in this quote by a sociologist, Simon Williams, who says, uh, when we sleep, where we sleep, and with whom we sleep are all important markers or indicators of social status, privilege, and prevailing power relations. And this reminds us that sleep isn't just a biological process. It's a process that occurs in context of, of the world and it's universal and it's impacted by all of these things. So um, a, a very, 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 very brief uh, history. Um, social and environmental influences on, on health have been studied for over 200 years. I mean, you have the first epidemiology studies going back to the 1700s, picking up steam in the, in the 1800s and, and even more so uh, um, in, in the 19th century and into the 20th century. Um, they start out in Europe um, and you have these early and mid 20th century studies that started looking at um, systematic differences and, and particular areas that were looked at were environmental exposures. So this is where you had a lot of dirty cities um, and, and, and air pollution and, and disease and sanitation issues, healthcare access and utilization, uh, and also differences in health status and outcomes based on, on who you were, especially socioeconomically. Racial ethnic health disparities um, research picked up steam, uh, especially in the 1990s, and culminated with this uh, Institute of Medicine report called Unequal Treatment. Um, this was published in 2003, 
Um, and it really defined the term of disparities for the field and really did set a research agenda. Um, since, since then, there's been some pickup in sleep research, uh, sleep disparities research. The very first study of sleep health disparities that I could find um, was published by Jardin Jean-Louis and colleagues in 2000. So it was 20 years ago, uh, but still relatively recent compared to other uh, disparities research. And this was sort of the key disparities takeaway finding was that uh, minority men got less, and, and women to, to a lesser degree, got less sleep than uh, those who were white. Um, there was some previous work that may have mentioned race or ethnicity differences, but this was really the first time it was a focus of a, a research publication. Um, probably the next key finding in the field was by Hale and Doe, Lauren Hale and, and Phoenix Doe, published in 2007 in the journal Sleep. Uh, and what they did that was that was particularly groundbreaking here was that they extended findings to a nationally representative sample showing specifically, ah, the labels aren't coming up here, but you have uh, Blacks and African Americans were more likely to be both short and long sleepers. Um, you had uh, Asian Americans more likely to be short sleepers and other um, non-Hispanic um, uh, Latino adults more likely to be short sleepers. And, and these findings have been replicated since many, many times. Um, there's a huge uptick. I'm not gonna mention all of the studies in this area, but I'm gonna mention what I think are a few key ones. First of all, um, you had uh, uh, Jardin Jean-Louis and, and colleagues really digging into this issue of um, ethnicity and sleep, not even just um, race, ethnicity, but how, how subgroups and, and environmental context impact sleep. Um, this, this was another groundbreaking study uh, led by Diane Lauderdale that actually extended these results to actigraphy in a large sample. Um, this was a study where we, where we looked at um, the interaction between race, ethnicity, socioeconomics, and, and, and other socio-demographic factors and how they fit together. Um, we now have a number of meta-analyses. There are two in particular led by um, Megan Petrov. Um, there's the, the term sleep disparity was coined um, by Nero Patel in this 2010 paper. Um, you have a uh, growing literature on physiologic and genetic mechanisms linking um, some, um, some of these uh, disparities outcomes. Um, you have more integration of uh, sleep disparities focus in other cohort studies. So here's um, a great study that came out of the HCHS Soul project, um, also showing bridging out from not just looking at Blacks and African Americans, even though that's where probably the most robust fundings are. Um, and then sort of the modern era of analyzing some of this data and really looking at some of these, these complex relationships linking sleep and race ethnicity, what is the role of socioeconomics, what is the role of, of racism and discrimination and cultural context, and all these things sort of fit together. Um, so here's the model, uh, a socioecological model um, that we've been using and, and, and really is, is trying to um, sort of set the discussion for the field and how all this stuff fits together. You have sleep, you have all these downstream health outcomes. You have metabolic, cardiovascular, immunologic health, mental health, behavioral health, and cognitive health. And all these domains um, are, all, are all integrated with each other. Um, and, and there's whole lines of research linking sleep with each one of these. But then what is upstream of sleep? Why, if we're going to make an impact on sleep in the real world of the public health, we have to understand what's upstream. So we have these individual level factors. These are the things like behaviors, beliefs, and attitudes, genetics, health. These are the things that if you cease to exist, they would cease to exist. And this is what drives individual sleep behavior. And, um, but what's important is the individual is embedded within a social level. These are things that exist outside of you that you're a part of. Things like your job, your neighborhood, um, your culture, religion, your social networks, your friends, um, your family. These are the things that these individual level beliefs, behaviors, and biology sort of come from. And we can't really extricate ourselves from these. I mean, anybody on this call, um, think about how your sleep in the past, just in the past week, was dictated by things outside of you, like your job, um, or your neighborhood, or your family, or the busy street you live on, or things you need to wake up in the morning for, or stay up late for. And even still, um, beyond, way beyond the basic sciences is, is the social level or the societal level. These are things that exist outside of these social constructs like social networks and friends and jobs and families. These are things like racism, uh, globalization, technology, public policy, 
um, the physical environment and, and, and conservation. These are things that actually impact sleep. There was a paper that was just published looking at um, wind turbines and wind farms and how that may impact sleep. So there's, there's a, whole, um, a, a whole ecology here of, of what drives sleep. Um, and thinking about going forward, there's a paper that recently came out from an NIH workshop that was led by um, NIMHD um, that was focused on sleep health disparities. So this was the paper that came out of it. Um, I was fortunate to be part of this workshop and, and, and so were a number of other people in the field. And this was sort of what we, what we set as sort of the agenda moving forward. We need more um, to develop and promote integrative research on sleep health disparities, not just looking at it from one perspective. Uh, we want further development on understanding the causes and consequences of sleep health disparities, and also interventions to address sleep health disparities. This is something we're a bit behind on. Um, and we also need to help build the research infrastructure and training opportunities for sleep health disparities, not just, um, not just funding research, but helping to build the pipeline. And so, led by Project Sleep, um, we, we sort of, uh, I, I, was, I was able to help develop some of these ideas. Um, I reached out to and got feedback from a number of people publishing research in this field, um, and, and I listed a bunch of them here. And uh, we also got some input and, and endorsement from the Sleep Research Society and the Society of Behavioral Sleep Medicine. Um, that these ideas were, were something they were willing to stand behind. There were these five policy initiatives, um, and this is what they were. Number one, we want to ensure funding for early career pipeline programs that help individuals of low socioeconomic status and underrepresented racial ethnic minority groups to thrive in the medical and research fields to help um, add their voice to the conversation because they have perspectives that not everybody in the field is going to have. And so we'll get better questions, uh, better science, and better answers if we can diversify the field a little more. Uh, we want to ensure dedicated research funding to develop and implement people-centered, community-led interventions to improve community awareness and treatment of sleep disorders and sleep loss. Um, so sleep as, as a domain of health, as well as disorders like insomnia and apnea. And, and the focus here is not just treatment of these problems, but also helping to increase awareness. Uh, Dr. Kylie mentioned the TASH program, which is a, um, a, a great example of this. Uh, we want to provide, uh, we, want, we want there to be more funding to educate the public health and, and healthcare providers on signs of sleep loss and sleep disorder issues, uh, specifically those impacting racial ethnic minorities and underrepresented groups. Um, I think there's a huge social justice issue here. Uh, the people who are not sleeping and having adverse health outcomes are the ones who are already systematically set up for, for worse outcomes in general. And a lot of the upstream factors have to do with things like work schedules and multiple jobs and shift work and, and environmental stressors that we could potentially intervene on. Uh, and we want meaningful research on funding to better understand and address these health disparities. Um, and research funding to study how school start times in particular are impacting low socioeconomic and minority communities. I mean, the school start times issue is probably the lowest hanging fruit as from a policy perspective, because the, the research is so clear um, that this is something that probably needs to be done. And it's important to draw attention to the fact that the communities that are most probably disproportionately impacted by this are, are communities that are already stressed. Um, so these are the five, uh, five policy initiatives that, that we were talking about putting forward. Um, and I'm hoping I'm not too far over time for that, for that brief introduction, uh, but if anyone has any questions, they're always feel free to, to ask, and here's my contact info. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, we do have a bunch of great questions coming in the chat if you want to check those out. We're